welcome, Dr. Kingsburg. I'm so th I'm we'll miss Nina. She's a fabulous interviewer, but I'm really excited to have um, more time to ask you more questions. Um, I want to first talk, tell the audience a little bit more about you. Um, you're the chief of, of the Division of Behavioral Medicine in the Department of OBGYN at University Hospitals Cleveland Medical Center. You're a psychologist with a clinical and research expertise in female sexual disorders, menopause, pregnancy, and postpartum mood disorders, uh, and also of the psychological consequences of infertility and cancer. Kingsburg is a professor of reproductive biology, psychiatry, and neurology at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine. She's a past president of the North American Menopause Society and of the International Society for the Study of Women's Sexual Health, which is my favorite organization ever because you pronounce it Iswish, which sounds really <laughs> romantic. So welcome. I'm sorry to read that, but there's so much, and that was a very brief version of your bio. Um, you got it. I'm so thrilled. Uh, I did. I want to tell everyone that I met Dr. Kingsburg doing this exact thing, interviewing her on a webinar for um, a women's health site, I think three years ago, maybe before I started Alloy. Um, and I was just so taken by all of the openness and um, frankness and expert expertise with which you address women's sexuality and sexual response. And um, we just couldn't wait to ask you to join our medical advisory board at Alloy because of course, sex is a big part of what happens to you um, as you go through menopause. So. So many places to start. Um, I just started chatting with, with Dr. Kingsburg earlier about the fact that I actually went to a brand new OBGYN this morning um, who told me about Rosemary Basson's uh, theory of sexual response. And um, I guess I'll just start there. So there are different theories about how women respond sexually. Can you just kind of take us quickly through the cliff sure. notes of what they are? Well, first of all, good for you for having uh, an OBGYN who actually knew who Rosemary Basson was. She is an internist actually in Vancouver who developed a model of female sexual response. Actually, it's not just for females, males as well, but um, it's based on sort of contrasting what has historically been a fairly linear model of how the sexual response works. So if we look back historically, the first two to empirically study the sexual response in males and females was Masters and Johnson who probably is before many people, uh, even our midlife women may have been before their time, but they were the first two to study the sexual response. And based on their physiologic research, they said that males and females always follow this linear progression of excitement where your body gets aroused to plateau where you reach this peak level of sexual uh, excitement with enough appropriate stimulation. And then the body has a reflexive release of all sexual tension, which we call orgasm. And then the body moves to an unstimulated state called um, the refractory period. So based on that, it's a very linear progression. Now in the seventies, we finally recognized that the brain was probably the most important sexual organ and that desire is really important for the sexual response. And so that linear progression was desire, arousal, orgasm. And then Rosemary Bassan in the 90s said, you know, that linear model doesn't always work um, and is not how many women experience their sexual response. That that spontaneous desire, horniness, if you will, may or may not be present, and that many women will either choose to be receptive to a partner or will engage themselves in a sexual encounter because of other motivations, either um, because they know it'll bring emotional intimacy, or they know it'll make their partner happy, or they read in Cosmo magazine that burns 500 calories, <laughs> that would be a reason to engage in sexual activity, even though they're kind of sexually neutral. They're doing the laundry, you know, grocery list in their head, or they're not really sort of focused in on sexuality. And only once their body gets aroused with enough sexual stimulation, and by the way, especially for our postmenopausal women, no pain, because that shuts the cycle down. But assuming that, that that response occurs, it's only then that desire kicks in. So the arousal precedes desire, and we call that responsive desire. Right. And then once that desire kicks in, it's like, oh, sex, this is great. Why was I so hesitant? We should do this more often. And that drives the cycle. So it's not that drive is always present, which is true. And for me, you know, and hopefully for, for your gynecologist, she could explain it as for me, it's like going to the gym. 
I have no spontaneous drive to work out. If I waited for my own spontaneous drive to go work out, never ever would it happen ever. So I know that about myself and I don't rely on spontaneous drive to work out. I just go there, I show up. And once I'm about halfway through my workout, my heart rate's up a little bit. I've got a little perspiration going. Then the smile comes on my face and I'm like, this feels great. Why am I so hesitant? So that's how responsive desire feels. But there are women who have spontaneous drive who then lose it, especially at midlife, and then they're really distressed by it. And what I want to make clear is that although responsive desire is a normal way for many women to experience desire, it is not the only way. And if you used to have spontaneous drive and you miss it and it's gone, you shouldn't just learn to live with it. You are allowed to ask for help. Sorry, okay, so long-winded this, answer to- No, no, we're song. here for your answer. This is, so I, this also gets something about um, the difference, there's so many ways I can take this, but um, the difference between the two, so there's, the, there's the, the lack of desire and then the lack of arousal, right? And these are two different sort of yes. disorders, would you call them? And they yes. both happen so, more frequently to women. Yes, well, menopause. getting to, and getting to some of the controversy in nomenclature and classification, we, the, the DSM-5, which is the psychiatric manual that lists sexual dysfunctions, um, is SWISH, International Society for the Study of Women's Sexual Health, and ICD, the International Classification Codes, really is, differs from that new model that combines desire and arousal into female sexual interest and arousal disorder. And that really, to me and to many of my colleagues, does women a disservice because there are clearly differences between loss of desire and loss of arousal, right? And so let me, let me explain it to you like this. When we think about sexual problems for women, it's best to categorize into about four general categories. There's problems with desire, which is appetite, wanting, right? The idea of wanting to be sexual, whether or not you act on it, okay? You can have desire and not act on it. So for example, when you look at a treatment for desire and somebody's counting sexual events as an outcome measure, that's ridiculous because it's not how often you have sex, it's whether you want it. So desire, arousal is the body's ability to feel general sexual um, uh, pleasure. So lubrication, uh, genital swelling, uh, engorgement of the, of the genitals, nipple erection, increased heart rate. So it's not just genital, but it, it's genital sexual arousal is sort of key to that. There's also cognitive arousal, which is not just wanting sex, but in the midst of a sexual encounter, feeling enjoyment of that. So desire is wanting, arousal is the experience of sexual pleasure and sensation. Orgasm, which is again, that release of all sexual tension, uh, usually experienced as pleasurable. And pain, pain with sexual activity is its own category. So that's the easiest way to categorize sexual concerns for women. And would you say that among the, you know many, many women that you've seen over many, many years of practice, there, is there one or more of those that is the most um, yes. incidents that you see the most frequently? Hypoact, we call it, it has a name, hypoactive, which is low, hypoactive sexual desire disorder, HSDD, which we'll call it from now on, is the most prevalent sexual problem of women across all ages. With That's about, lack of desire. That is lack of desire with distress. So in order to meet the criteria for a diagnosis, you have to be distressed by it because you will see many women who would identify as asexual. That is, they don't have any desire and they're not bothered by it and they don't wanna be labeled and by all means we don't. So to meet the criteria for HSDD, you need to have loss of or low sexual desire and be distressed by it, okay? About one in 10. So the prevalence in the, in the United States is about one in 10 and actually it's probably worldwide. And um, Susan Davis actually did a study in, in Australia and the rates are probably higher. Uh, she did a prevalence study more recently, and the rates in midlife women are even higher than that. Yeah, I was going to say, it gets worse, or like it, it, more women experience that for the first time in, in menopause? Yes, or the pre right. The prevalence rate in, in women of all ages, about one in 10, 
in uh, postmenopausal women or women between 45 and 65 is about 14, 15%. So it's not a huge increase, but it is an increase. So just curious, do you have any sense of the percentage of women who are not bothered by a lot, like the, the asexual identifiers? You know, I should know the prevalence of that, but I don't um, because yeah. there hasn't been necessarily quite the national surveys on women who are not bothered by their life right. desire. And I wonder in any sexual survey, like do women really tell the truth? And is there a lot more out there that is not reported? Well, one of the, the ideas behind a, an anonymous survey is to hope that we can get sort of the truth there, but probably it's an underestimation um, because who's going to fill out, you know, if somebody sends me a survey and it's about sex, am I really going to fill it out? So yes, so there's probably an underestimation of the rates, um, but it is, even with that underestimation, one in 10 women suffer from hypoactive sexual desire disorder. Um, and until 2015, there was not one um, FDA approved treatment um, for HSDD. Now, when we think about treatments, think about desire um, as we think about depression, right? The, the key feature for depression is loss of interest in things that bring you pleasure. It's feeling flat. It's not necessarily sad, it's flat. And the loss of motivation to go out and do things that used to bring you pleasure, right? That's what depression is. So with HSDD being very similar, it's the loss of interest in things sexual, right? You're flat, you can go through the motions. And in fact, most women in partnered relationships are having sex despite having HSDD. It's, we call it mercy sex or duty sex. They're just going through the motions and they may even have an orgasm. They just have no interest in it. There's no, they say that was nice and they would never do it again. There's no motivation and they're distressed by that. They used to enjoy the anticipation of sex and romance and now it's gone. So the similarity is flatness. And when we think about depression in the 1980s, before the first SSRI was approved, and that was Prozac in 1988, depression was seen as all in your head. It was all psychological. It just go on a tropical vacation or pick yourself up by the bootstraps or go get psychotherapy. Once there was an easy to prescribe medication, the SSRIs, the medical community embraced and recognized that depression was also biologic, that it wasn't just psychological all in your head, that there are neurotransmitter imbalances that can, can impact um, uh, mood and therefore it was accepted as a medical condition and therefore treatments could include psychotherapy, for example, cognitive behavior therapy, pharmacotherapy, antidepressants, or a combination. Now, fast forward to uh, current days and hypoactive sexual desire is sort of very similar. When we think about it, um, for some women, psychotherapy works great. I do it for a living. If I didn't think that psychotherapy could help mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, addressing negative beliefs about sexuality or past sexual experiences, you know, I'd be out of business. But so yes, psychotherapy for some women with low desire, very helpful. For others, they would come in and say everything, you know, my beliefs about sex are good, my relationship's great but I've lost my drive for sex and I don't know where it went and I really like it back. And for them, a pharmacologic option might be good. And for others, the combination, psychotherapy and a pharmacologic agent. So we, we need those options for women because it's not a one size fits all. Okay, and so what can, we, what can we take? What can we do if we're experiencing okay. um, low desire? I, so, we've talked a lot and heard a lot about testosterone, but before we get to testosterone, let's yeah, talk okay. about Okay, we'll talk about answers. that too. So okay. the, the first thing is to think about the, the think about desire from a biopsychosocial model. So biologic factors, psychological factors, cultural belief systems, and interpersonal factors. Think about the relationship. If the relationship is the cause of, you know, if you don't like your partner and you don't want to sleep with them, that's not hypoactive sexual desire disorder. That's a relationship issue. If you're clinically depressed or if you have performance anxiety or body image issues, that's not hypoactive sexual desire disorder. You want to work on those things. But if you have, if you, everything else is okay, right? And you still say, but I, I used to have desire or never had desire, but if I used to have desire and now it's gone and all of these other things I've sort of looked at and are not the, the cause, then you might consider a pharmacologic option. There are two FDA approved pharmacologic treatments 
for HSDD. And guess what? They are only approved in premenopausal women. That is- What? So we can't have them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, well, you can, but it's off-label, right? It is off-label use. So your, your prescriber can absolutely prescribe it, but you would have to pay out of pocket for, for a off-label use. The FDA really um, in the division of, you know, uh, gynecologic products um, really sees premenopausal and postmenopausal women as essentially two pop different populations, even mm. though both of these medications are non-hormonal. So mm. has nothing to do with hormones. And you, by the way, you don't see antidepressants that are approved only in premenopausal women or postmenopausal women, but yet these two non-hormonal CNS, central nervous system acting drugs, are approved only in premenopausal women. Doesn't mean they don't work in post. They are just not indicated in that population. And in fact, for the first one, which is called Addy, Flavanserin is its generic name, ADDYI is its brand name. Uh, we have studied it and I've done the trials uh, and it does work in postmenopausal women. It just doesn't have an indication. And the sec and that is an oral medicine. You take it at bedtime. Um, and it takes anywhere from four to 12 weeks to show an effect to increase it's a long time, the, the want it is essentially the same kind of time that you would give testosterone or for example, any other CNS drug. So if you go to your doctor and you get put on your SSRI, how long do they tell you to wait to see if it has an effect? They usually remember. say four to, four to six okay. weeks, been okay. that long, but four to six weeks. So <laughs> Um, with desire, I'd say we saw in the trials a separation from placebo at four weeks, but it can take mm -hmm. as long as eight to 12. Now, Nina had on another guest at one point that was talking about the high placebo rates for testosterone, but also for these other medicines. Can I just say that any CNS drug, central nervous system acting drug, always carries a high placebo response. It is really? just one of these drugs. The endpoints are very subjective and you will typically see whether it's overactive bladder, whether it's mood and antidepressant, you will see about a 30% placebo response. So wow. if a drug can show an improvement above and beyond that already high placebo response, it shows that the drug probably does have some benefit, not for everybody. Not yeah. for everybody. It is not a one size fits all and it doesn't work for everybody, but, but it does work. And to say, well, it has a high placebo response just says that's how these drugs work. They always have a high placebo response. Huh. So um, Nina's going to kill me if you don't get to this one question, because we've talked a lot about the loss of desire and there's so many other questions I want to ask there. And if anyone else has some questions, please let us know. But um, the loss of like orgasm not being as great as before. Yep. What is that yep. called and what can we do for that? What is it called? Um, <laughs> distress, but um, uh, frustration. Uh, and in fact, we actually did, a, we went to the FDA at one point to look at a, a different formulation of testosterone to see if it would improve um, orgasm. Um, and the data wasn't great for that particular formulation. It was a nasal spray, um, a nasal gel. Uh, but what the FDA wanted was a, uh, a study of what lack of orgasm felt like to women. And I actually published on that. And the, the term that, that resonated most with women was frustration. Right. Um, their distress was related to frustration. Hmm. Um, but uh, can I just finish with, there are three drugs for oh, right. okay, desire sorry. disorder. Mm -hmm. So uh, Addy is one and that you take every day, every night mm -hmm. at bedtime. Vilesi, V-Y-L-E-E-S-I, or brand name Bremelanotide, is actually an on-demand um, drug. It is in an uh, auto-inject, like an EpiPen, mm -hmm. that you would take when you wanted to have desire. Um, and then there is um, testosterone. So um, okay. there are three potential options. Okay, so there's one where like you're all of a sudden you're, okay, let's go, I'm feeling great, I want this. And you just have to whip out a needle and inject yourself. Yeah, just okay. a minor distraction to yeah, yeah, having sex. Well, you know, <laughs> uh, I will tell well, you- Whatever that, it takes, but, I guess. Yeah, but, that if some women don't want something on board all the time, they don't want to take a drug every day. Uh, and for them having something on demand, they're like, you know, I have sex once every two weeks. 
I'd like to have an appetite for sex when I have it. And it's a very easy, you know, it doesn't hurt. The, nobody dropped out of our trials because of the injection. Mm. It didn't hurt. Mm. Okay. Um, the, high, the highest side effect was uh, nausea, actually. And what was interesting mm. is that despite the fact that 40% of women at one point had some nausea, hardly anybody dropped out because of it. Uh, 8% dropped out. Um, mm. So 92% who had nausea stayed in either because it went away after the first time they took it or it was very manageable, it was mild. And you have about a 16 hour window to mm. use for the medicine to last. So it's not like, okay, I took it, we gotta go right now and then it's gone. You have about a 16 hour window. Huh. And then the third one is testosterone. So um, there, ISWISH, the International Study for the Study of Society for the Study of Women's Sexual Health just published in this past year, a clinical practice guideline for all of your practitioners to use that says, look, there's no uh, approved um, testosterone product for women. Women have testosterone. Women at menopause, when you reach 50, the, the, your testosterone levels are about half of what they were in your 20s. So it has gradually been declining since your late 20s. And for some women, that decline in testosterone is noticeable as loss of drive. Mm -hmm. And all of the evidence in terms of research would suggest that uh, the, the use of testosterone in women, postmenopausal women with HSDD uh, is evidence-based. So you need, again, off-label use. We recommend using actually a male version because it's FDA approved, these male versions, for example, Testim comes in a nice little tube and you would use one tenth of a man's daily dose because women have one tenth of the amount of testosterone as men. Oh. And what you're trying to do is bring women back to uh, what, their, what their premenopausal levels were. So you're not giving them a high dose. You're not taking them out of their normal premenopausal physiologic range. You're just bringing them back to what their premenopausal levels were. And for some women that will improve their drive, not all but for some, okay. And does that right. also take four to 12 weeks? Or four yes. Okay. yes, it does. Yes, it does. It's a, I've, know, heard some, I've heard some people love it and think it fixes everything. And I've heard what some people like, eh. Right, so, well, there, there are some women who feel more energized and they, their endurance is better, but really the data are really only geared towards hypoactive sexual desire disorder. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. The data would suggest that is where the evidence lies in what it should be used for in women and not, and not the idea if a little is good, a lot is better. No pellets, mm -hmm. right? No right. injections, a topical dose that really is just a, brings you back to your premenopausal level. Okay. No and pellets. is it hard to find a doctor who prescribed that? Shouldn't be. It should not be. Um, unfortunately, it is because so many OBGYNs don't learn about um, sexuality. They don't learn about menopause. So first of all, find a NAMS certified uh, menopause practitioner and um, somebody who, who will actually ask you about sexual function because you already, if they're not asking, they probably aren't wanting to talk about it because they should be. Yeah. I spent yeah. my career trying to teach clinicians, just ask, just ask sidebar because I want to get into the orgasm response too but just quickly I'd never really asked you this how did you get interested in studying this and becoming a professor of this and, and treating people well remember I am a clinical psychologist broadly and behavioral medicine more specifically looking at the psychological aspects of medical conditions and uh, as I you know spent some time in in the field of behavioral medicine it became clear that so few people actually talk comfortably about sex and yet it is key to basic human existence and quality of life and so somebody needed to do it um, and so it was a very small field um, but like-minded people who thought you know this is such a basic need for for our quality of life and health by the way it's not just about happiness it is about physical health um, so and, uh, that we know that that poor sexual health is correlated with decreased physical health. Um, it, it impairs uh, mood and function, and it has a cascading effect. And healthy sexual function improves health, mood, quality of life. Uh, 
Yeah. I did hear recently that the, the orgasms in general are just great for keeping your vagina strong. Am I saying that? And is that correct? Yes, you, can keep, you can keep all the pelvic floor muscles. Um, so mm -hmm. the vagina is only one, you know, that's just the canal there, but there's a whole, right. there's a whole cascade of pelvic floor um, muscles. Um, and, uh, you know, first of all, it's pleasurable anyway, but all of sexuality is important to keeping um, vulvovaginal health. So the phrase use it or lose it, which has been uh, misaligned or, or maligned, excuse me, or maligned recently, actually is true that keeping the, the tissue um, uh, patent, the patency of the tissue, the stretching of it is really important for, um, for the health of the vagina, not just because with menopause and without estrogen, the vaginal canal narrows and sometimes shortens, but even the anticipation of penetration often becomes uh, 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 tensing, uh, creates a problem. Hmm. Yeah, so we've got to talk about estrogen because at Aloe, we believe very strongly. I mean, we don't believe, we, we read the science and, and are very passionate about giving women better access to expertise and to you know, FDA approved hormones for their menopausal health. Um, but we've talked a, little, a lot about testosterone um, we let's talk about estrogen, vaginal estrogen. What okay. are the different kinds and what does it do for you? And we, we've, we've heard maybe I can't remember from you that, um, I'm fact checking everything, Cheryl, um, that topical estrogen cream and, or the, uh, suppositories will, is one key to better orgasms. Okay. So yes, it's important because without um, estrogen in the tissue, in the vaginal tissues, um, lots of problems can happen. And the sensation decreases, the, um, the tissue itself, I hate to say it, atrophies. Um, and so there's less blood flow to uh, the clitoris and to the whole vaginal canal. So all of that can impair all sexual function, including orgasm. So when we, when we think about what happens at menopause, everybody knows about hot flashes and night sweats, everybody does. But what most women don't realize is that estrogen is really important in the vagina and the whole urogenital canal. And so while hot flashes and night sweats might start in perimenopause and you kind of get it, the changes that happen neurogenitally happen gradually, but they are chronic and progressive. And so while hot flashes will eventually, God knows when, go away, this will not without treatment. And so the loss of estrogen in the vagina causes the tissue to change. And we actually have a term for it. It's called genitourinary syndrome of menopause. GSM, yeah. genitourinary syndrome of menopause. Why? Because the old term was VVA, which stood for vulvovaginal atrophy. Three reasons we changed it. One is women did not want to be told their vagina was atrophying. Number two, it did not address the fact that it's not just the vagina that is isn't that is in trouble when you lose estrogen, but the whole urogenital tract because good bacteria that changes as the pH changes, if you don't have estrogen in your vagina, can then um, affect urogenital tract. So you have more UTIs or you might have pain with urination or other problems. And the third reason is until recently, you really couldn't say vagina on television or in the media very often. And so it was really hard to talk about vulvovaginal atrophy when I would be told by a host, okay, you can talk about it, but don't say the word vagina. It's crazy. So it's so frustrating. Vagina, vagina, vagina. <laughs> uh, so we can say it. Um, vagina, vagina, vagina. Okay. So but using estrogen cream, will it help orgasms? Yes. Uh, yes, it can help orgasms. It can't, it doesn't always fix it. But if you noticed that as you hit menopause and you were having more dryness or changes in the vagina and you were not on local hormone therapy, you might notice that you're orgasms were less intense. I don't want to say it will fix all orgasm problems because not all orgasm problems are created equal and not all are related to GSM. But it certainly would be the one of the first things that I would be doing is talking to my uh, gynecologist or nurse practitioner or primary care about local estrogen. There are local hormones. So when we think about local hormone therapy, we call it local because 
there is virtually no systemic absorption. So women who are worried about hormones, mm. which you will cover on another Which episode, you won't, you don't need to be worried about them anymore. Uh, right. They're not dangerous. Uh, but. And, and the North American Menopause Society just announced that their new position statement on hormone therapy is coming out in July. So stay oh, tuned for that. Yep. Um, there was an announcement today. Mm. But, um, but even if you were worried about systemic absorption, these are not systemically absorbed. Um, so even women who are breast cancer survivors should talk to their oncologist and their provider about potentially being on them. Um, because it just works locally. Um, so you have estrogen creams, you have an estrogen ring, you have an estrogen um, gel cap, um, you have um, DHEA, dehydroepiandrostenedione, which is uh, prasterone, which also works to affect both estrogen and androgen um, receptors in the tissue. And there is a, another oral medicine called ospemaphine or osfina, which also works locally to affect the, the uh, tissue in the vagina. So those are all of your options. So we're big fans of the cream at Alloy and we sell it. Um, but Nina, last time, I'm gonna, I, have to I have to read you the question that she texted me directly. She said, um, feel free to share that my orgasms are seriously lacking these days. And I've just asked my doctor for an estradiol prescription, meaning the cream. Um, even though that stuff is totally goopy and gross and cannot be used if you want anyone to go down on you. So how do you manage that? Well, she could A, use, there are so many other options. Okay. Oh, and I did forget one. There's a little teeny pill that is inserted in the vagina as well. So that's hmm. um, Vagifem or Uvifem is that's generic. <clears throat> so okay. there are many options. She could use the ring, which is kind of like a, a little, um, literally a little ring that you can insert almost like a diaphragm that stays in your vagina for three months. Um, and so- okay. That will not okay. be goopy or, you know, you can have oral sex. Okay. Um, and there's, it's such a slow release that your partner is not going to get estrogen absorbed with oral sex. Um, okay. The cream is fine. And if you're, if you like the cream, then, you know, you're going to be using it twice a week. So might pick your days to have oral sex on 24 hours after you used your dose. Okay. Cause it doesn't just only work like then and there it's, if you use it consistently, your vagina it is will right. be it is twice a week for the rest of your life, twice a week okay. for the rest of your life. Okay. Starting dose every day for two weeks and then twice a week forever, because if you want to maintain urogenital health, even if you decide at 90, you don't want to be sexual anymore. And I don't know why you would stop at 90, but if you did, you still may want uh, local estrogen because you want the tissue healthy. You don't want to develop UTI and end up dying because you had a urinary tract infection. So no, I didn't realize that was the reason for all the frequent UTIs that many women experience in, in menopause. I did not yes. quite understand. I knew that that was a and symptom. elderly women who end up in the ER from a nursing home because they have UTIs. Okay, oh, so oh god, anyway, do this. so then the the gel there's a little um, gel cap um, which is. Invexi, which is interesting because it comes in a four microgram dose and a 10 microgram dose. And a lot of breast cancer survivors and their providers like the four microgram dose because it is the lowest dose ever. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so again, that's not goopy. Um, it has a little bit of migliol in it, which works as a little bit of a lubricant um, and you can insert it and it doesn't fall out and it doesn't mm -hmm. drip up. So um, mm -hmm. DHEA, the, the, which is um, Intrarosa, that's their brand name, is you use it every night. So that's a, it's kind of a, like a little waxy pellet and you insert that. Um, and I'm looking and so the question is, does estrogen cream need to have a prescription? The answer is yes. All of these are, mm -hmm. uh, these hormone therapies are, need prescriptions. I hate to be salesy, but you can go to myalloy.com and we will prescribe you estrogen cream. It's really indicated for almost absolutely everyone. And as, as Dr. Kingsford was saying, I know that we're almost at time, but I have promised everyone and talked for ages about your treasure chest of toys. Um, when we first met or we had our first Zoom oh. meeting, it seemed like you had this box in front of you and you just kept bringing out show and tell. Are there- I, um, and I should have them all. I, I see some weights over there, and um, <laughs> but I, I usually do. So I would encourage everybody to get their own box of toys, by the way, because um, we didn't talk about vibrators. And I know Nina's had other guests that have talked about vibrators. I love goodvibes.com. I think they're awesome in terms of a very 
female friendly. Um, but again, not one size fits all. So if you're going to use a vibrator, you might want to invest in a few of them. And some of them are very low cost. Um, and it is not a, you, you become dependent on a vibrator. But I just saw a woman today who was petrified to tell her husband that the only way she could reach orgasm was with uh, a vibrator. And, yeah. you know, and the fact is that intercourse is not a reliable way for the majority of women to reach intercourse, uh, excuse me, to reach orgasm. Um, and, and while penetration may be enjoyable, and this women who have sex with women, as well as women who have sex with males, um, the fact is that penetration is not particularly reliable for orgasm. About 25% of women can reach orgasm with penetration, um, which means 75% need clitoral stimulation. And so please be honest with your partners and don't make them feel like they're inadequate because it's not, it's, it's how we are physiologically designed, anatomically designed. It is, it is um, a surprisingly delicate conversation, even with people who know each other very, very well and have been having sex with, for 20 years, just speaking frankly. Um, but I do, everyone has, we did a survey actually, we first, even before we launched Alloy during the, COVID, during the first three months of the pandemic, when we thought, oh my God, this is so hard. We've been living you know, with our partners for three months, we're already so sick of each other. What does everyone recommend as, as a vibrator? And we got so many different responses. I mean, there really didn't seem like there was one that was the greatest hit. Do you have one or two that are the most popular? Well, of course there is, and I know this was already on uh, the podcast, um, the Hitachi magic wand, and I love the history of it. The um, Babes in Toyland story was uh, the history of the Hitachi. Um, and that's tried and true. It is very large. It is a back massager, but the volume <laughs> of the head, which is not to be inserted, is nice for women who who like the, it's almost, it covers a, a lot of, of territory, the volume of the reach of the vibration. Um, and so that's nice, but it is bulky. They have smaller versions. I happen to like, there's one that I like because it is huge, it is so inexpensive, it's $15. It's called the uh, Turbo Glider and uh, Cal Exotics makes it. And you can get it either on Amazon or on goodvibes.com because it's, it's battery powered, it kind of is penis shaped, but it doesn't have to be. Um, but you can use the pinpoint either for external sort of pinpoint or the, the shaft of it for more, um, it covers more ground. It does not have to be inserted. And it has, as you open it to put the two batteries in, um, it works like a rheostat. So it, you can control the speed and the intensity instead of just an on off or two two speeds, you can control it. And I love the fact that women can then control speed and vibration, and it's very inexpensive. Um, you want something that is easily, easily washable. Um, there are, you know, Dame products makes these nice little um, uh, ones you can wear. There's one that you can wear during penetrative sex if you want both. Mm. Um, there is one that you can just put on your finger, um, but you need to kind of explore and find a few because some women will need strong vibration others need variety um the fancier doesn't need to be the more expensive doesn't need to be there you can get things for for less expense and i'd say buy more that costs less than just buy one expensive one great advice i love it i think we're i think we're at time i, I think sydney told me to have to go over 40 45 minutes but i could ask more questions all day so we'll have to do this again we're so thrilled to have you as a medical advisor at myally.com we will be we do sell hormones and um a symbiotic right now but we will be ex um, expanding into more sexual health products as well because it's such an important part of the conversation and and we should not be suffering in our sex lives just because we're actually reaching this glorious time in our lives so thank you dr kingsburg thank you sydney and thanks to everyone who joined us today well thank you for having me i could talk about sex all day as you know <laughs> we will we'll do it again all thanks, right everyone okay